tell us your story with Dr. Ebony. I am Dr. Ebony. Today's topic is commemorate and exonerate. My guest today is a well-known history scholar practitioner, Mr. Michael Burgess. Welcome, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Yes, thank you for agreeing to come on. Um, now, just for a little background, uh, Michael and I, this is actually our first official conversation. We met briefly right after church last Sunday. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and that was after I had already sent him an email because my mom had attended um, a, a seminar that he had kind of put on for people within the community. Um, and it was talking about what his pro his current project is, which we'll talk about that a little bit later. And um, so my mom came home and was telling me about it. She said, hey, I think he goes to your church. So I said, fine, let me look in my little um, book here and see. And sure enough, he was on there. I said, well, I've got to email him because I've got to interview him. <laughs> 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 so I got in touch with him. He agreed. And so now we're here today. So before we get too deep into conversation, uh, where did you grow up? So I actually grew up in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. It's in Greenville County. Uh, growing up, we had two stoplights and a blinking light and, and the big <laughs> highlight. Uh, my senior year of high school is our town got a Burger King. We'd only had a Hardee's. It was all Hardee's <laughs> all the time. And getting a Burger King just just totally was, was the thing to do was to cut class and go to the quote unquote BK lounge. So that was, <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, it's in the foothills. It's, it, it's just at the base of the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually left there in 89 and went to the University of South Carolina. Uh, I began dating my now wife in 1991. Uh, we got married in 96, and, and when that happened, when we got engaged, she took a map, drew a radius around Columbia, and said, we will only go this far. So, so <laughs> I've been in the Midlands uh, since, since coming down here in 89 for college, and, and it had just stayed. Wow. Okay. So from being up in the foothills of South Carolina, mm -hmm. what was your family makeup? So it's, a, it's an interesting mix. Uh, my dad's side of the family is uh, Scotch-Irish Presbyterian that settled in, uh, actually, I think, squatted on Cherokee land in the late, in the 17, early 1770s. Mm -hmm. And my mom is from Columbia. Uh, she is first generation Lebanese American. So it's, it's, it's an unusual mix between 18th century Scotch-Irish Presbyterians uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather was we were sharecroppers and moonshiners. And then my mom's side of the family, which arrived in, in 19 in the 1920s uh, and storekeepers uh, who, who were able to send their children to college. My mom, to college being one. And uh, the two of them met somehow, some way when my mom was head basketball coach in the 1960s at North Greenville College. Wow. That is very interesting. <laughs> so having that kind of mixed background growing up, how was growing up? I mean, how was the, well, I know it's different. <laughs> definitely, definitely different. Uh, my, on my dad's side of the family, and you would think, cause we're living in Greenville and his family is, is, you know, settled in the table rock area. Like I said, late 18th century, but his mom had passed away in 1957 and I was born in 1970. Mm -hmm. His dad passed away in 1972. So there wasn't a ton of Burgess family, family reunions and history. Dad was the baby of the family. Uh, and actually, even though we lived in Greenville, it was more or less, I was connected to my Lebanese American heritage. Uh, you know, my mom went to Dreer high school uh, and, and her, her father owned a, or my grandfather owned a store in Shandon. Uh, but, it, you know, obviously we're going up in a small rural town and being a Lebanese American, and I was, had, had very dark features because I was always outside mm. in, in 1980s travel dress at times was not easy, <laughs> not easy wow. at all. I can definitely imagine. So, um, 
what are some of the stories, if you don't mind sharing, of things that might have happened to you? Uh, well, yeah, there, there's or your few. family. There, there's a few. Uh, I, you know, the, the the first realization that being a Lebanese American in, in the United States, that even though we went to to in Greenville to St. James Episcopal Church, there were people that Travis Rest still looked at you a little differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, at, at times. Uh, kids, I guess being kids would think it would be funny to call me, you know, the mad Arab, you know, wild man from Sudan. And, and while they thought that was funny, you know, it really hurt my feelings uh, because, you know, I'm thinking of my grandfather who I love very much, my great grandmother who who lived to be, be a hundred. And it just, to me, it was, but it was, it was an insult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you try to, you try to fight back and whatever, but, you know, to, to quite frankly, the adults, both at, at school and in the community, that wasn't a big deal. Oh, they're just calling you names, you know, sticks and stones and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, I did have, uh, I think the story that sticks out most from, from my high school days a, as an example of, even even in the 1980s, the latent the latent you know I suppose racism or or, or xenophobia or just plain meanness that mm-hmm. exists to the non-white population was I had a date planned for with with uh, the head cheerleader Cindy Younghands. She, yeah. uh, she was she was well the the stereotypical 1980s head cheerleader who was also an honor student and we had we were in that process of we were friends but but it was heading to more than that Mm -hmm. and so we both had a love and this is going to sound weird uh, of a band Bruce Hornsby in the range yes and (laughs) he was coming to the Greenville Memorial Auditorium and and I asked her hey do you want to go my dad bought the tickets uh we were all good to go and then the day of the concert she comes to school. She looks very upset. She says, Mike, I just can't go tonight. And I'm like, well, what's going on? He said, Mike, I just can't talk about it. I just can't go. And mm-hmm. then she just left crying. Well, right. her brother played on the basketball team with me. And I asked him, I said, dude, what is up with this? Mm-hmm. So Mike, I'm going to tell you this. And, and you, you know, I know you're going to be mad. But our dad last night told her that you ain't going to no concert with no Arab. Whoa. And so from that point on, other than being able to sort of hang out at school, uh, there was there was no future to that relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and this is 1988, mm. you know, Travis Rest, Greenville County, South Carolina. Mm. Uh, and I was learning that there's still at that time people who, if you were not white, they didn't care who you were, where you're from, what your parents are like. That, that my dad's family had been there since the 1770s. It was all based on, on the, their perceptions of, of race and ethnicity. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, and you know, the thing is still going on today. Yeah. And, and when I talked to my mom about it, she shared a story. Now this is much earlier. This is late 1950s, Shandon, Columbia, Hand, hand junior high and now hand middle school mm-hmm. uh, where she would tell the story of, of how one of her teachers was adamant she was black, did not think she needed to be at hand. Ray's came with the principal. The principal's like, you know, no, we can't, we're not moving her. And so uh, the principal or the teachers would sit her back at, at the back of the room. And this is you know, time before we really understood special ed and whatnot, set her next to a special ed student that was allowed to beat on her the entire school year. No. And so for her to have experienced that and, and to, to me to experience the, the name calling and, and, and the deal with the dad, you know, you weren't, you're not going out with that boy, you know, that boy mm-hmm. um, was, was extremely disappointing. And, and Ebony, what Dr. Ebony, what, what, what is even more disturbing are stories we're even here hearing like this in our schools in Lexington and Lexington yeah. School District 1 today. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if we're going to get into that later, but yeah. uh, the fact that their children today experiencing what I experienced 
experience and I experienced what my mom experienced mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is a wake up call to the need to have these conversations about race and ethnicity and, and, and building a, a diverse and tolerant community. Right. So how has those experiences and stories from your family impacted your life? Um, I think, I think maybe more so than, than a number of people. I'm, I'm very much empathetic with, you know, marginalized groups in our society. Uh, while I have n no conception or clue of what it, what it is like to be black in America or black in South Carolina, or black and rural South Carolina, I like to say I've had glimpses of it, you know, short snippets of it, you know, whether it was my experience in high school or, you know, being pulled over uh, in 2000, uh, myself and, and three of our, I was coaching basketball at Spring Valley mm -hmm. and three of our basketball players uh, had summer school. So, so I, I was the assistant. I waited behind. I loaded them up and went chugging up the interstate. Interstate was blocked, so got off the road, driving through Lawrence County, and got pulled by the local sheriff's deputy. Oh, uh, so Lawrence. immediately comes up to the window and say, why are you boys driving so fast? And I looked at him like, boy. And <laughs> the, the player that was sitting in the front seat with me immediately shot me an elbow. And when the officer went back to the car, they're like, coach, you're going to get us killed. And, 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 and I realized that we had been pulled not so much for speeding, though, though we were a little over, like five miles over, mm -hmm. but because what he saw what, what was four, four black guys in the car right. in the country in Lawrence County, <laughs> which at the time had the redneck shop in downtown yes. Lawrence. <laughs> uh, and he was going to pull us over. And he was very disrespectful, not just that, but throughout the conversation. And here I am an adult, uh, a coach, et cetera, but that's not what he saw. Right. Right. Wow. This is amazing. I have to say, um, I've had my own experience with the Lawrence <laughs> officers and having to go to court right next to the redneck shop. Oh yes. 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 <laughs> Which is now owned by a black family. I saw and, that. Yes. So, you know, History has a way of kind of changing things. So speaking mm. of history, uh, when did you discover your passion for history? You know, that's hard to date because it's just sort of always been here. Um, as, when I was, I mean, my, as far back as I can remember, I've loved some form of history. Mm. Uh, I, I, would, I would argue maybe my earliest memory of, of loving history is there used to be in the 70s. Uh, a TV show called Baba Ba Black Sheep. And it's about a World War II fighter squadron in the Pacific. And I love, for whatever reason, I love that show. And I think that's when I was five or six. Uh, so, and, and, and I remember at that same age when there was the bicentennial train in 1976. Mm -hmm. And it came through Greenville and going to visit that. And so history has always been, been a, a, a predominant piece of, of who I am and what I do. Okay. So how did the switch from being a history teacher to being a research practitioner come about? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think I've always researched at least, all right, I won't say always research because I was, I was not the most <laughs> focused student in college at times, <laughs> but, but I've always read history and I've always been interested in going to sites but in terms of the, becoming an intensive researcher, I would say about 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. uh, I joined this group, Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution. And it's not a reenacting group. It, it very much is a, a group of amateur his, historians and archaeologists. And, and, and the only thing amateur is just the fact that we all have day jobs and do this <laughs> okay. on the side. There's mm -hmm. lawyers and financial brokers, et cetera. And pretty soon you ended up with a research project and I had to learn in the 2000s how to find sources, how to verify sources, how to track things down. And so as, as over the last 17 years, you know, different topics come up and I have, you know, the certain way to go about doing it. And, and often those topics, they find you as opposed to you finding them. Oh, that is so true. That is so, so true. So please explain to all that will be watching this, 
what historical event you are currently looking at to educate, commemorate, and exonerate? Well, okay, so there, so my, my list of history projects has grown over the last week. <laughs> like, <it's> seriously <laughs> grown. Um, I will tell you the, the, the other three that are, that are maybe numbers two, three, and four, depending on the day. They're not number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm continuing to work on, uh, on the River Bluff campus, our understanding of two cemeteries related to the, to the historic, to new Mount Zion AME church mm-hmm. that date back to the, the end, of, end of the civil war uh, and continuing that research and, and, and doing some archeology span related to that to try to locate the 1874 wooden church. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I found out this weekend through just, Sometimes it's just being a nerd while watching football. You need to do this research. <laughs> and I went down this rabbit hole and learned that on one of the lines of my dad's family, I hadn't really explored beyond Civil War, that my fourth great grandfather was a Revolutionary War hero who was mortally wounded at Kings Mountain, was the highest ranking officer wounded there. Wow. Uh, and then, then today, and then I, an ongoing research has been with the Corley family uh, over on Corley Mill Road. And I had a great lunch today with Craig Corley. Mm-hmm. And on the 24th, I'm meeting with a, a, a number of the members of the family to, to present my research. Um, but the number one thing that has, that has dominated my life uh, in, in a good way since late April, since actually early April of, of this year, has been the, the lynching of Willie Lee Part on May 5th, 1890. Mm-hmm. And it literally talking about topics, finding you, the story found me from a student question on a history hike that my students give to the sophomore class uh, at River Bluff High School uh, of the African-American story of, of the community in that, on, on our campus. When a student asked one of my students, well, what do we know about lynchings in this, in, in this area, meaning River Bluff or even in Lexington County? My student didn't have an answer. They asked me, and sadly, I didn't have an answer. So I went looking, uh, and I used the, the, the Equal Justice Initiative website out of Montgomery, Alabama, mm-hmm. uh, who is behind uh, the monument that commemorates the lynchings in America. Right. And it listed eight here in Lexington County between 1890 and 1921. Mm-hmm. And the first one on that list was Willie Lee Park. Uh, and, and what was striking about Willie Lee Park was it was a 16 year old boy and that there was a huge paper trail, uh, whether it's newspaper articles or court documents, we know pretty much everything related to, to his story uh, in 1890. The other seven, seven lynchings, there is, there's a very limited paper trail. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in those cases, there was no, never a court hearing or proceeding. So there's no legal documentation, you know, other than a brief mention in the local newspapers of the time. The other seven, uh, we just don't know much about. Mm-hmm. But it just happened that the first one I started looking into was this incredibly tragic story of a young man who was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, even though he did no wrong. Mm. Okay. Wow. That's, that's heavy. That really is. I I didn't even realize there have been eight. Mm -hmm. I knew there have been at least three that I knew of, but I didn't know there were eight. That is wow. Something to really think about there. So what are you working on in regards to that particular history moment right now okay and, and i don't know how much detail you want because this this could go oh, on a long hey, time well, hey, but I will, give, I, will give, I will give you the cliff notes version first and if you okay. want to dive into to some specifics we can so uh, on january 26 1890 a young woman by the name of rosa cannon was staying at the house of former reconstruction republican congressman manuel simeon corley who was a par- parishioner at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church. It appears from newspaper articles that come out later that spring after the murder of Willie Lee Part that she was pregnant, that she belonged to a mill family in Bates, the Batesburg-Leesville area, that she herself was a mill worker, 
-hmm. and that in that day and time, it's the, 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 the typical story of a girl gets pregnant, unmarried by someone who does not want, want this to be known. And so her family sends her to, to Congressman Corley's house, which is on Main Street, Lexington. Uh, and we don't know why the Corleys and this family are friends. Mm -hmm. um, there's no evidence to indicate uh, what, what the relationship was other than at one point, Congressman Corley writes a letter to the father and says, you know, I'm your good friend, et cetera. But, but definitely in two different worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that night, uh, Simeon Corley and, and his wife went to St. Stephen's, different time period. Sunday night church was night night church, was at nine o'clock. Wow. And so he is at St. Stephen's with his wife. Uh, the young girl, Rosa, is alone. And at some point that evening, uh, her brother runs, 14 year old brother Owen, that is also staying at the Corleys, runs yelling into the street that someone has attacked his sister. Oh. Uh, and in the pro and so as she tells it in both the grand jury indictment of Willie Lee Park and in, in her trial indictment, uh, same testimony that at some point around nine o'clock, uh, Bessie was, they were in Bessie's room. We think Bessie was probably the house servant mm -hmm. uh, at that time or a nanny and Bessie's asleep, but they're in Bessie's room, her and Owen reading and the window pops up. And, and a young black man sticks his head into the window, demanding food, then demanding money. He knows the Corleys have money. And at some point when she goes to get this, he allegedly enters the house. Mm. Uh, at that point, Owen runs out of the house. Supposedly a, a, a rape took place. And then the guy disappears with a, someone that was in the yard as a lookout. Later that night, Willie Lee Part is apprehended. Uh, it should be no interesting to note that she does ask the person when he sticks his head in the window, what's his name? And he says he's Bailey from Columbia. And then her description of him does not match the description of Willie Lee Part. Mm -hmm. uh, Willie Lee Part is, is, is a small 16 year old boy who appears to be, uh, and just using the time, the, the language of the time period, a mulatto, or in one newspaper, they, they describe him as a ginger cake toned Negro. He's light skinned. He's by, you know, possibly right. biracial. Mm -hmm. uh, they apprehend him and they bring him to where she can see him. And if you read the account, it's clear she has no idea who this is. Because later she will say in her testimony, uh, it was whom they tell me is Willie Lee Park. So one of the adults in this uh, had told her that, yeah, you're a, this is your attacker. And his name is Willie Lee Park. Even though she had gotten a look at, at the person that stuck his head in the house, he, she had asked him his name. And the description of the attacker does not match the, the description of Willie Lee Park. Uh, it should also be interesting to note in her testimony, Bessie, who evidently slept through all of this, is never mentioned again, even though you would think wow. if all this is going on. Uh, there's something, something to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is Jim Crow South. This is literally the spring where Ben Tillman announces his run for governor, uh, advocating lynching. Mm -hmm. And pretty quickly, uh, Willie Lee Park and his brother, Edward, are jailed and held there until a trial in, on February 21st, 1890. Ironically, there's two different descriptions of the charges. In the jail log, which thanks to Lisa Comer, our clerk of court, she allowed me into the bowels of the old courthouse to dig through these you know, antiquated uh, legal books. And we found the jail log, their charge is assault. However, on the legal side, they're charged with rape. Uh, and when, uh, and Lee Part is appointed a court appointed lawyer, a gentleman by the name of George T. Graham, who lives over on Hendrick Street, like his house used to be, it, it's burned down at the inter intersection of, of Third and Hendricks. Mm -hmm. And so in, when they get to court, the charge is rape, which floors his attorney. And we know this because while we don't have a trial transcript yet, 
we have the attorney's March petition to try to get Willie Lee Park's sentence reduced in which he literally says, you know, he was charged with assault. We got the court. He's charged with rape. You know, that, that's, that's malpractice. Right. Uh, the trial goes as, as you expect. Uh, even though Willie Lee Park's fam father, his father's a widower, had through the attorney produced a list of double figure eyewitnesses that were going to testify that there's no way Willie Lee Park could do this because he was with us. Mm. Um, not a single one of them testifies. Now we're still trying to find out why. The easy guess is there were some threats made that if you show up, mm -hmm. you're next. Right. Um, and so this is in February. Uh, the jury takes 20 minutes to deliberate. They, they find him guilty. It's a capital offense. The judge sentences to hang, him to hang on April 11th of 1890. Uh, he will remain in jail. Ironically, his brother, Edward, uh, is released the day before the trial, even though he was charged with the same crimes. We, we, we have no documentation of, of what allowed Edward to go, et cetera, but he, he, is, he is released. Uh, during the month of March, his attorneys uh, petitioned Governor, Governor John P. Richardson, and provide there the alibi that we believe was presented in court as we still search for the trial transcript, which indicates that Willie Lee Part at nine o'clock on Sunday, January 26, 1890, was at, at the New Bethel AME Church, mm -hmm. which is the same exact location off Lake Drive where it is today. Uh, and in this petition, you know, the, the, the lawyer re-arguing his case mentions that the prosecution said that the alleged incident took about five minutes. So think about that. From the time the window opens wow. to the time that, that, that adults come to her rescue is five minutes. And timing is everything here. Mm -hmm. Further, he presents a, a distance argument. So hopefully the audience watching this knows where New Bethel AME Church is. If not, look it up on Google Maps. Mm -hmm. Simeon Corley's house is to the, the 378 end of, of Main Street. You know, roughly where the old driving academy, or maybe it's still there, Walgreens, in that area. Right. So, this, so in the testimony from one of the witnesses that was supposed to testify... Thomas Waring, but did not in February because we believe of threats. Uh, Waring indicates he was with Willie Lee Park all night except for 20 minutes. So for 20 minutes, Waring, I guess, runs home and comes back. He comes back to the church. Willie Lee Park's still there. So he leaves him. 20 minutes passes. He comes back. So what that would mean is Willie Lee Park would have to go over a mile from New Bethel AME Church Mm -hmm. to the Corley house at the end of Main Street, do all the things that the prosecution says takes less than five minutes. You know, head in the window, enter the house, attack the girl, make his escape. And then we'd have to be back down at New Bethel AME Church, 20 minutes total. So you get five mm -hmm. minutes for the whatever supposedly happened and 15 minutes of travel time. Seven and a half up, seven and a half back. Uh, a, a, a good runner will struggle to do that today. Even mm -hmm. if you stop all the stoplights right. and clear the way, if you try to make that, that effort, it's going to take more than that. So, so, and there's another witness, Isaac Jones, who will corroborate Thomas Waring's testimony. The governor still refuses to get involved. Mm -hmm. But the first week of April, actually on April 9th, uh, Lee Park's lawyers present new evidence to the governor and the governor won't say what it is, but he immediately postpones the execution. He grants him a reprieve. But in this, in 1890, this reprieve means simply a postponement and postpones the ex execution to May 9th so he can further look into the case. He also orders on April 9th Lee Park to be removed from the Lexington jail and brought to Columbia for his own safety, which was a wise move. Soon as the, the leading citizens of Lexington, including a large number of member, male members at St. Stephen's, learn of this, they have a meeting, they issue a resolution that's printed in the newspaper, 
they send two people to represent them to the governor. And they pledge that if you will return Lee Park to Lexington, nothing will happen to him. Mm. Uh, and they say it's, it, it's, a, it's an insult to their honor that he was removed and taken to Columbia. The government governor relents, sends him back to Lexington. Uh, so you get into late April, and then on May 3rd or 4th, there is a rumor that spreads throughout the community that Lee Part is about to be removed once again to Columbia, where the governor is going to pardon him after reviewing the, the at this point, undisclosed evidence. Pretty obvious what happens next. Mm -hmm. The lynch mob begins to form. Who's the leader of the lynch mob? It's a gentleman by the name of F.C. Kaufman. F.C. Kaufman is one of the, the leading political leaders in Lexington. He's a Ben Tillman political operative. Uh, he's a member of St. Stephen's. He's buried in our churchyard. Uh, and he is also, interestingly enough, one of the eyewitnesses the night of the incident on January 26th. So just let that rest there, that this guy who was supposedly a witness and we think just runs into Owen or the girl is now leading a lynch mob uh, of possibly upwards of, of 100 to 200 people, some from in town, some from out of town. They are going to be masked. And at two o'clock on the morning of May 5th, they take a sledgehammer and break down the door, the, the door of the jail. Uh, in the jail is the sheriff at that time, George S. Drafts, who is also a member of St. Stephen's and is literally buried 10 yards away from F.C. Kaufman in our churchyard. Uh, so, so if you think about that, three of the main characters we've already talked about, Corley, Kaufman, and Drafts are all members of St. Stephen's and they're all buried in our cemetery, wow. which, which is an interesting, which is one of the interesting connections there is. Uh, they entered the residence of the jailer, George Drafts, Sheriff's Drafts. They said, give us the keys. And Drafts refuses, to his credit. Uh, they actually um, shoot in the air pistols, four or five shots, uh, and then uh, proceed to uh, continue to threaten. And Drafts is not giving up the keys. He's actually hidden it upstairs where his two children are. And one of the young children calls downstairs to find out what's going on. And a couple of members of the lynch mob go up the stairs. Mm. And at that point, drafts relent, draft relents, gives up the keys, and they are able to breach the cell block. Once in the cell block, their intent is to pull Willie Leapart from his cell, take him over to Hendricks Street, and lynch him in, in the front yard of his lawyer. However, and we know this because there's another prisoner in the cell with Lee Park, who in the coroner's inquest done the day after uh, is going to, uh, is going to, excuse me, um, it, it testifies of what happens. And he talks about at 2 a.m. They hear people knocking down the, the door. Lee Park turns to him. They're about to get me uh, when they breach the cell block. Lee Park briefly uses him as a human shield, and then the guy breaks free, and, and he's, he's evidently white, and they let him dive into another cell. But then he witnesses what happens next. Every time they tried to enter the cell, and this is a credit to Willie, um, he hits him with a stick. <laughs> and, and, and multiple times is able to repel their attempt to grab him. Mm -hmm. When they try to stick a, a lamp in the cell to, to see where he is, He'll shatter the lamps. I mean, he's putting up a great resistance. He's fighting for his life. Eventually, right. they get tired of that. And 30 to 40 men somehow fill this cell block, according to, to the witness in the other cell, and fill the cell with lead. I mean, they, they fire almost 200 shots. Kill him. They drag him from the cell. They shoot him 16 more times. And the next day, the coroner essentially indicates in his report that he literally is shot to pieces. Uh, after which uh, they take the body and they bury him at the Lexington Poorhouse Cemetery, which is roughly in the area of the current uh, retirement home at the intersection of Maxi and Old Cherokee. There's a cemetery out there somewhere. But from the coroner's inquest the next day, you see that this is not just going to go away, uh, at least for F.C. Coffin. 
uh, that drafts testifies, his wife testifies, it's written in the coroner's report that mm -hmm. while they couldn't see any faces, uh, that they could, they, they, un, heard, un, they knew one of the voices. Mm -hmm. They knew F.C. Coffin's voice. They go to church together. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. They've heard him sing. They've heard him talk. He's, he's a, a great <laughs> orator. He speaks all the time and they recognize his voice. And he and one other gentleman are arrested and jailed for the murder of Willie Leapart. In the week afterwards, the governor finally releases the secret evidence. And it was affidavits gathered by a U.S. Marshal uh, with the support of Rosa Kent, the young girl that was allegedly attacked, father uh, it should be noted that the Cannon family did not attend the trial of Willie Leapart to support their daughter. They don't believe her. And so they hired this marshal to get to the bottom of this. And he does. He interviews the younger brother. He interviews the older brother who Rosa has written to. Uh, the older brother gives him letters from Rosa to her mom, where she admits that there wasn't a rape, that it, at best he was putting his hand over her mouth to keep her from screaming, and she has no idea who Willie Leapart is, that someone told her that the, 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 the guy was Willie Leapart, but, but she's not sure. She doesn't, she doesn't know mm -hmm. if that's the guy or not. And that was the basis for the governor granting the reprieve, and he allows the, the news media, you know, this is the age of the newspaper, into uh, the Leapart home, and they, uh, or excuse me, into his, the governor's office, I, I'm sorry. And he, they, it allows them to copy the affidavits verbatim. So we have verbatim wow. in the newspaper. We might not, we don't have the original affidavits, mm -hmm. but we have the word for word, this evidence that led the governor to grant this young man a reprieve and was the basis of, of what was supposed to be coming in the form of a pardon. The rest of the story is a story that is told over and over throughout the South. Kaufman has tried in June. His defense doesn't put on any witnesses because he knows he's not going to be convicted. Mm -hmm. Newspaper accounts say Rosa Cannon and her whole family were there. Uh, and that the courthouse, which is opposite the current old courthouse, right. uh, where the, the mortgage company is today at the intersection of Maine and Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, and women dressed in whites around the courthouse. And he is acquitted fairly quickly. Uh, Tillman, Tillman will, of course, win election for governor mm -hmm. and Kaufman, for his reward for supporting Tillman, will get a patronage job of Senate reading clerk. And so from that, the story finally, after, you know, really you get a couple hundred newspaper articles in April, May and June of 1890. And then the story fades. We know Kaufman will endure his own tragedy in his family. His son, Franklin Jr., is murdered on Church Street by Harmon. Uh, ironically, Franklin Jr. and the Harmon are both buried in our church cemetery at St. Stephen's. Um, he will later move to Columbia. Uh, Kaufman will. It seems that even though that he was acquitted, uh, much of Lexington begins to just sort of shun him. Mm -hmm. That, yes, you're acquitted, but, but we don't like the fact as eyewitnesses indicate later, that you're running around the town the day after the murder of Willie Lee Park with blood on your shirt, loudly boasting that you did it. Mm -hmm. And so he, he ends up living out his life in Columbia. Uh, Rosa Cannon, we lose for a period of time until she resurfaces, uh, getting married uh, probably 10 years later to a farmer from Greenwood. And so she'll live, live, live out her life in Greenwood and then the only Lee Park family member we know of besides Willie and Edward, we lose sight of Edward, but Dahl Lee Park, his, his, his father will die in the Lexington County poorhouse in, in roughly around 1910. He's on the 1910 census and will, um, we will see you know, we, we, we won't see anybody else from that line of the Wheatley Park family again. Wow. So, all right, that is the education part of this. So what are you trying to do as far as commemorate and possibly exonerate Willie Lee Park? So in April, initially, 
the my daughter wants to go play. So I had to, had to give her the signal. <laughs> um, the idea was, well, let's do a historical marker at the old courthouse where we know the lynching took place. And again, there are eight lynchings, e e EJI list. This is the only one where we can take you to the spot and say it happened here because the old jail uh, is where the old court 1940 courthouse is today. Right. That They tore the jail down and they built that courthouse. So if you've ever had to go there for traffic court, uh, which I have. Uh, or anything in the old courthouse, you are on top of the lynching site. You're on top of the old jail. So we, we started that and we were able to, to merge with some other groups interested in doing a community remembrance project. And, and they rightfully so wanted to recognize all eight lynchings, which is a tremendous amount of research and scholarship. And, and so while we certainly support that, um, we began as we've uncovered more and more of this story to realize that while that group works on a historical marker for all lynching victims, there's something greater we can do. And mm -hmm. that the summer with the discovery of the grand jury indictments, the trial indictments, the petition to the governor, the coroner's inquest, the, all the trial stuff related to the Kaufman's lynching trial, we believe we have a preponderance of evidence enough to vacate his conviction for rape. Because just because he was granted a reprieve his sentence was not, was not commuted. His, I mean, his sentence was com temporarily commuted, but he wasn't exonerated. Right. So this young 16 year old boy who was brutally murdered for a crime he did not commit uh, is still on the books convicted of a rape he had no part in. Mm. And so our intent, uh, it, and when I say our, we've, we've created the Justice for Willie initiative we met with some of the leaders, including your mother, in, in the African-American community last Tuesday. Uh, but myself, Chief Green, uh, Kim Cockrell, who's the victim's advocate for MAD, this, we've taken this on. And in some ways, Willie has, is, we feel connected to him. I mean, literally connected to him. It's, it's a powerful thing. And so we are looking to, we are engaging a lawyer, pro bono, of course, Mm -hmm. who has agreed to, to look at the record and feels like there's a case to be made um, with the hopes of, of clearing his conviction of rape. Uh, you know, we, we can't go back and, and get Kaufman charged with the murder because of double jeopardy, mm. but we certainly can get uh, this young man's record and reputation repaired. Right. Wow. So after this long history lesson, I know living in Lexington, because I've been living here pretty much my whole life. <laughs> and since you're from the area um, and you've been a member of St. Stephen's, what kind of kickback have you received from the research work that you're doing, especially in this Willie Lee Park case? So it's, it's, so it's interesting because the Post and Courier published an initial article, I want to say last April or maybe early May, uh, Adam Benson's great writer, and he wants to continue to, to cover this story. Um, and, you know, that article came out. I, I was interested to see what the response would be. Mm -hmm. Really, I've only had two negative ones. Uh, one was an anonymous letter that closed with good luck keeping your job. Uh -huh. um, but, it, but the guy, whoever wrote it, I won't say guy could be a one. I don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. Coward if you're not going to put your name to it. Right. Uh, and then I did receive uh, one late night voicemail from a, a no collar ID number, which basically said you're in your family need to get the F out of Lexington because you are an, an in lover. Wow. Um, but he sounded very intoxicated. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, he closes the voicemail with. And have a good night. <laughs> I'm like, what, <laughs> what? what are you doing here? <laughs> but, but maybe the litmus test for me is I presented this case to our Lutheran men's group at, at St. Stephen's. And keep in mind, this is the church of Simeon Corley. And, it, it, and from letters that Simeon Corley wrote to the father of Rosa Cannon, he is very much involved in, in and I'll share this part because I overlooked it, and, and what newspapers are calling the conspiracy that in that time, week or so after the lynching, you know, week, two weeks after the lynching, there are three different pieces of newspaper articles 
that roughly said the girl was pregnant and they said she was ruined or she had been betrayed mm. from someone in her community right. and that this was a conspiracy to cover it up by blaming Lee Park for it. And then they lent, they murdered him to keep it quiet. Um, and I, I was like, well, wow, why would you do that? And then it made sense. Why were they looking for a, 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 a light-skinned African-American Mm-hmm. Well, she was pregnant. She, she right. is from low socioeconomic status, but the baby's probably going is it not probably was going to be white. And we have no record of whether she had a baby or not. We just know that the papers reported she was pregnant and that it appears that Corley and Kaufman thought Willie Leapart would make a good foil because then they could say this poor girl is pregnant because of a rape. And you can't blame her for this brutal attack. Mm. Uh, now, again, we after June of 1890, we lose track of Rosa until she gets married almost 10 years later. And right. there's no mention of a child. If it was born, it was probably uh, given to someone else. And so she could return to Batesburg. Because, but, but it became pretty clear when you read those articles and you look at the timeline there was a conspiracy here to cover the pregnancy up and to use Willie Lee Park. And when it was became clear that this wasn't going to happen, his execution, because dead men tell no tales, right. that they were going to take it in their own hands. So with that, uh, I presented to our, this case to our Lutheran men's group at church. And obviously you have court, you have, you know, the Corley is, is, in, the 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 is in the cemetery. is in the cemetery. Sheriff Drafts you know, is in the cemetery. The lawyer that will defend F.C. Kaufman at his lynching trial, H.A. Metz is in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So there's some history here. Mm -hmm. And I was a little apprehensive, but it was extraordinarily well received. No negative feedback, people coming up afterwards. Thank you for telling us this. How can we help? We appreciate it. Uh, It it was welcomed. It, It wasn't begrudgingly received. It mm-hmm. was welcomed. And these are by people who are may or may not be directly descended to the men, names I mentioned, who very easily, if, if their families were in Lexington in 1890, the men of that family possibly most likely participated in this lynching. Right. But I think, you know, the character of, of this group of Lutheran men realized that this was a horrific, horrific tragedy and, and that the, the, the wrong must be made right. Uh, but other than that, there hasn't been negative feedback. Uh, I will tell you, I was a little concerned when meeting uh, with, with the group of, of leaders in the African-American community we met with, uh, including your mother, mm-hmm. who was, I was so excited to meet, uh, in that when we had first proposed the historic marker in the spring, there was some worry about, well, is this going to, we're going to end up catching backlash from the white community. Is this going to divide us further? But at that time, we didn't have the full story. And after presenting the full story and, and connected it, and I told you we'd come back to this, to some of what's going on today in our schools, mm. uh, there wasn't, there was zero hesitation. And it would be difficult to move forward without their support. Right. Uh, with that. But, you know, this school year alone, we've, we've, I've heard of a, I've heard an account of a, young black girl at, at one of our middle schools who was, nobody would sit with her and her all, and, and the rest of the class was white. Mm-hmm. Uh, a young man was told to go sit with her and he loudly said, I ain't sitting with no black girl. Yeah. And the teacher did nothing. Now did she do nothing out of malice? I don't think so, but she literally didn't know what to do. The administration's like, well, I, there's nothing in the rule book about this. Right. But it's what we call, a, and I'm sure you're familiar with, a microaggression. Mm-hmm. There was another young lady at another one of our middle schools, a young black girl, who was having her lunch taken from her every day by a white guy, a bull, just a prototypical TV-style bully. Mm-hmm. And very little had been done about that, uh, that it had just continued and it continued. And no matter what she said, it, 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 it was not resolved the last time uh, a group of us met to discuss this. Wow. And then today, uh, I learned of another story at one of our middle schools 
where a young black girl was holding a door open for her class. Uh, and one of her classmates says, yeah, that's right. You should be holding the door open. And the girl says, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you might, and the, the, the white kid said, you're my slave. Whoa. And the girl said, said, said if you say that again, we're going to throw fists. Right. The girl said it again. And the young, young lady who had been Ooh. defamed and insulted um, fought her. And, and, and right. it got the best of the fight. Yet the, the, the young black girl was it's sent home up for expulsion. Right. And the white girl was allowed to finish out the day. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, where we have constricted ourselves for in all man matters of, of discipline in high school to where you've got to go by the letter of the law and you, you cannot exercise any judgment or common sense. There's nothing on the books that says you can forgive someone for fighting because someone said what that girl said. Right. Uh, and so, you know, you hear these powerful stories and I shared two of the three of those stories with, 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 with the leaders we met with. And at that time it was, yeah, we're on board. We'd rather have the exoneration first and foremost than the sign, mm -hmm. uh, let's go. Uh, and, and that was very much what we needed to, to get moving. Wow. <sighs> Yeah, and you just mentioned those three stories. I've had my own daughter that's in high school. She told me some stories of stuff that's happened to her during mm -hmm. this school year. And the thing about it is she's mixed race. So they can't really figure out if she's Mexican or, mm -hmm. if, you know, they have no idea. Because um, And then with her name being what it is, they have no clue. But um, there have been some situations where my my mama radar was like, I, just one more time. That's all I need. And I do mean one more, right. <laughs> not one more. Right. Um, so, and it's, it is sad because we are in 2021. Mm -hmm. and, and so, oh yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I was just going to say, you know, with, and there's still a lot of fear of retaliation. You know, if you stand up for yourself, exactly like the example that you gave of the young lady finally standing up for herself, because we don't know how many times she's actually experienced this from this same person. It's true. Um, you know, we, we don't know what this came from exactly. So it, it's a lot that needs to be taken into consideration that is not currently. And, and it's all because we're not talking about it. Right. And, and so when people ask, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you bringing this up? you know, you know, why does it matter? And I said, it, it, it not only matters because, because I believe uh, like Dr. King and injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. Uh, if I would modify that quote, it would be an injustice at any time in our history mm. is a threat to justice in the present and future time yeah. in our history. Um, but it's also, you know, until we confront some of this under the surface latent racism that it might not be as direct as it, it was in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. but still exists. It's obviously when you, you know, these are children, uh, middle school children who are doing these things, they learned it from somewhere. Right. Uh, and somewhere they were told that it's acceptable. And because we haven't accurately dealt with it, uh, both in the schools and as a community, uh, people who do these type of things feel empowered to continue to do them. Mm -hmm. And again, it may not be as blatant. Well, in these cases, it was blatant and in your face. Right. But there's a lot of other things, too. And we all know it um, that exists. And, and I would add, it's not just the black population, but, it, but it's the non-white population. That, that the common yes. cause uh, mm -hmm. of all of us, whether it, your mom told me a story of a Lebanese family, I think I'm distantly related to, um, not being able to go to Lexington schools in the late 60s, early 70s, and having to be driven to Batesburg. Mm -hmm. uh, same family I'm from. Right. Or, or same, you know, country I trace my roots to. Um, and a lot of it is because nobody wants to deal with the uncomfortable nature of this conversation. Right. And if anything, um, by seeking this exoneration, we can have this conversation. It, maybe we can only change one or two minds, but that's one or two minds that, that we have successfully gotten to realize stuff like this is not acceptable. And, and, and not only that, if you're a human, you don't do these type of things. Mm -hmm. 
You're exactly correct. So from, from people that aren't really interested in history, that find it boring or unnecessary or would take the current rewritten history because mm-hmm. they haven't gone all the way back to look at the full history, right. just listening to what they're hearing now, what would you say to them about the power of history? You know, I, I'd say that unless we have a full understanding of our past, we have no way uh, of really getting what's going on at present and certainly no guideline for shaping a positive future for our children and grandchildren. Mm-hmm. That, that you have to understand the past uh, and understand how we are, what we are today. If you intend to build a better world for, for your children and grandchildren, otherwise, some of these same instances that we've talked about with my mother in late 1950s, Han Junior High, and me in the 80s mm-hmm. at, at Travis Dress High School, and some of our students today in 2021 will continue. And, and further, it concerns me that with the political rhetoric of the last five years, especially, right. that we're seeing almost a, a, a return of some of the in-your-face obvious uh, attacks on, non, on the non-white population. And at what point does the verbal attack turn into violent attack? And it doesn't seem we have political leaders, at least here in, in South Carolina or even in Lexington, willing to, 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 to take a stand here. You know, we don't have our own Lexington County version of Robert Kennedy, uh, who was willing to stand for African-Americans and poor whites from Appalachia and the Native Americans and Hispanic farm workers. We don't have that. Right. And, and so as a consequence, there's a limit to how much this, this town of town and county of Lexington can actually progress into the 21st century. Mm. And we've talked about some heavy stuff yeah. during this interview. So you now hadn't me, you hadn't asked me to let the, maybe the question. The question. Okay. The well, question. what question? Okay. What question are All you right, so, to ask? So, <laughs> the, the question is often one thing people will use and they, and, and one or two tried to use it with me uh, of, in the community um, is that I'm some kind of woke liberal radical from the North. <laughs> And it's at that point, I, I think it's an advantage. At, at that point, um, I mean, I let them know. Uh, I had five, four great, great grandfathers and one great, great, great grandfather fight for South Carolina in the Civil War. Right. Uh, and three of them died. So, so don't, you know, so, so if you're wondering, is this some, some hippie liberal from California? <laughs> no, I'm born, raised here in South Carolina. I have family history here in South Carolina. But thanks to my parents and my grandparents Mm -hmm. uh, and my church, uh, St. Stephen's and and, and Pilgrim Lutheran before that, and and all the churches before that, I know the difference between right and wrong and and that the wrongs have to be made right. Otherwise, you know, I couldn't sleep at night. I mean, I don't want to go to my grave with knowing this young man, Willie Lee Park, was innocent and we did nothing about it. Mm. You're right. Absolutely right. So this is coming to my final two questions. Okay. And, and this has something to do. You've mentioned my mother twice. Yes. (laughs) And since she's a a music person. Yes. These questions revolve around that. Okay. I I don't know much music, but okay. To be the most important um, humanizing questions of the interview. All righty. And so the first one is what is your favorite song that represents you? Wow. Uh, well, it depends. Um, honestly, working on this and, and, and work and, and at times speaking out, uh, I'm very heavily involved in the educational reform movement, uh, you, you know, speaking out against injustice. It's holler if you hear me from Tupac or <laughs> fight the power from public enemy. I'm pretty oh, sure power. I like in that. 1989 Traveler's Rest, myself and my friend Will Fuller, we're the only two people uh, who had uh, Public Enemy at cassette tape, Fear of a Black Planet, which has Fight the Power on it. Um, so, so those would be the two. I like it. Um, that, that I think as I continue to work at this and I think about, you know, one thing, and I don't know if you could see it real well. My oh, daughter yeah. made a black and white bracelet and it replaced the rubber band that I mentioned in the newspaper article. 
that I put on once I realized that just knowing about Willie Lee Park wasn't enough. You've got to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that if I don't, knowing what I know, don't do something, who is? Right. Um, and so I'll wear that. But yeah, so it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of Tupac and Public Enemy these days. <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, what song do you believe best represents history? Hmm. Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Can we be more specific with this? <laughs> well, I mean, just any type of history. I mean, because, you know, music represents history in a lot of and ways. It's true. If we're talking, we're talking civil rights, uh, which, which we, we should, and we should do more of. Uh, I would say Pride in the Name of Love from U2, which is about <laughs> Dr. King and Gandhi, et cetera. And it's, uh, it's funny because I'll play that for my students mm -hmm. and they, they're like, yeah, we like this song. So what's it about? They won't know. And then we'll talk about it and like, whoa, never just to be blown away. Right. Uh, I certainly think that represents um, our need to, to create a, 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 a community that is that no longer looks at skin color or race or ethnicity, but rather just it, it's about about love. And, and that's what Gandhi and Dr. King were preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, though I must say, um, uh, as much as, and I respect Dr. King, love Dr. King, but I'm sort of a, I sort of love Michael, Malcolm X a little bit more <laughs> just, <laughs> because that just fits my personality. Uh, that is one of the most impactful movies in my life. Cause you didn't ask me about movies. Yes, I did. Uh, was in 1992, myself and Ryan McGee, Ryan McGee is now has his own show on, on at the SEC network, mm -hmm. Marty and McGee went to the Bijou Theater in Greenville to watch Sp Spike Lee's Malcolm X. Wow. And I will tell you, both of us were, were dramatically, drastically changed coming out from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and to this day, uh, if anybody asks, what is your favorite or most impactful movie? That's it. Um, because you know, I'm I'm sort of aggressive. I, I like I like a little activity. <laughs> See, and, that's and, why no, we're no, gonna go along just fine. We all want to be Denzel. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to be Denzel, and and we want to be married to him. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and by the way, that also has a really good soundtrack too. Just throwing that it out. Does. It does indeed. Keep it on the music realm. Michael Burgess, thank you so much for your time and telling us your story today. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to come on and, and I hope we can talk again sometime. Yes, definitely. And to all of you, thank you for watching. Take care and may there be peace, love, understanding and social justice for all.